Hey, everybody. Welcome. This is Dr. Levi with your show, The Dr. Levi Show. Today is January 20th, 2016. I'm here in beautiful Los Angeles. Beautiful day here. So I hope and believe that wherever you are right now, it's a great day. And remember, you create your day. So if you want to have a great day, you can do that, of course. Well, I want to thank everyone for subscribing to our YouTube channel. We have over 12,000 subscribers right now, which is fantastic. Our goal, of course, is 1.5 million, if not 1.5 billion. So I want to thank you for joining us there. And I want you to know that this show will be a dedicated show each month of Q&A. We'll take your questions and answers basically from all the social media platforms. So if you have answers about something that, that's not clear about something I've said, if you have questions about something that you need clarification, you can let me know via Facebook, via Instagram, via the website, in the comment section on YouTube. And remember, my address is, like my name, Dr. Levi Harrison. The website is D-R-L-E-V-I-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N.com. All social media platforms is exactly the same, Dr. Levi Harrison. So I want to thank you for joining us, and I want you to know that our show is really about the following. We want to empower you, we want to educate you, and we want you to live the best possible life you can have. So it's about inclusivity. Anyone, no matter your race, your creed, your religion, that does, that's, that's, that's not my business. My business is to help you as a human being live a life of full health so that you can be exercising, you can be eating properly, and more importantly, make mindful choices about what you eat, about what you drink, about what you smoke. All those things, of course, affect our health. So this show is dedicated to the questions that we receive from many of you on Facebook as well as on YouTube. Now, this is, I, I, I entitled this show, Your, Your Carpal Tunnel Boot Camp. <laughs> it's going to be about all things carpal tunnel today, all things about tendonitis. Anything I can do if you're doing a lot of work on a console, if you're doing a lot of keyboard work, a lot of data input, if you're a, a gamer, if you're a UFC fighter, if you're an office worker, our goal here today is to help you prevent carpal tunnel, I want you to be educated about carpal tunnel, as well as different forms of tendonitis, as well as different types of physiologic pathologies that affect your hand, your wrist, as well as your thumb. So let's begin. Again, this is your Carpal Tunnel Boot Camp 101 with Dr. Levi. So happy to have you with us. So carpal tunnel is actually the, the number one peripheral nerve entrapment syndrome of the upper extremity. So you have multiple nerves in your upper arm. You have the radial nerve, you have the median nerve, you have the ulnar nerve. The carpal tunnel issues are always involving the median nerve. The median nerve is a nerve which goes through the carpal tunnel, which is an area of the wrist. And inside the carpal tunnel, there's the median nerve as well as multiple flexor tendons. And there's a sheath over the tunnel called the transverse carpal ligament, the TCL ligament. And sometimes this ligament can become very thickened. However, there are multiple causes of carpal tunnel. So let's go over many of them. Carpal tunnel can be linked to diabetes, to rheumatoid arthritis, to osteoarthritis, and even to pregnancy. Sometimes someone can develop something called gestational diabetes as well as gestational carpal tunnel syndrome. During the pregnancy, because of the increased water retention, they actually may develop carpal tunnel. Now, with that said, many times after the pregnancy has come to fruition, the carpal tunnel issues will resolve. The same with diabetes, gestational diabetes, the same thing. Often after the baby is delivered, then the diabetes will actually go into a quiescent state or actually just go away. Now, other causes of carpal tunnel include trauma. You can actually have a fall or an injury that may cause a dislocated wrist or a broken wrist or a fractured wrist. And we say in medicine, I want to clear something else. When we say in medicine that someone has a fracture, fracture simply means a break in the bone. They're the exact same thing. The, the depth of the fracture can be dependent on if it's an open fracture or a closed fracture. An open fracture means the bones actually come through the skin usually. So with that said, back to carpal tunnel. If you have a wrist injury or a broken bone in your hand or your wrist, it can also cause impingement on the median nerve, which can cause carpal tunnel syndromes. And I'll tell you about the symptom symptomatology of carpal tunnel syndrome. So let's review a few things. So rheumatoid arthritis diabetes, 
gestational carpal tunnel syndrome, when someone's pregnant, they may have it. Hypothyroidism can also cause this, as well as tumors. So you can have a ganglion cyst in your wrist that can also cause impingement of the median nerve, which can cause carpal tunnel symptoms. Now, with that said, I also want to say the, the bottom line is this. When it comes to carpal tunnel, we don't know why some people develop it and why some people don't. There has never been a clear correlation. Also, there have been many studies, some from the Mayo Clinic even, that will state quite clearly that there is no definitive correlation between repetitive motion injury and carpal tunnel. For example, there are court reporters that I take care of. Some of them have carpal tunnel. Some of them I'm seeing for very different things. But you would think that because of the incessant typing that they're doing and data entry that every court reporter or every executive assistant or everybody who does extensive amounts of keyboarding, of texting, of game playing, that they would develop it. Well, it's not true. We don't know why some people develop it and some people don't. So that's the bottom line. Yet there are those correlations that I spoke about earlier, such as diabetes, hypothyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, of course, different forms of trauma, as well as a tumor can be there, a form of cancer, or even a bone spur you can have in your wrist that can cause impingement on the median nerve, causing the following problems. So now let's talk about the symptomatology of carpal, ten carpal tunnel syndrome. So the bottom line is this. Often someone presents with numbness and tingling in their thumb, their index finger, and part of the ring finger. Now I want to show you the part of the ring finger. So if you're looking down at your palm and divide your ring finger in half, the half that's closest to your middle finger is the half that's affected by carpal tunnel syndrome often. So again, carpal tunnel affects your thumb, your index finger, your ring finger, and half of your, excuse me, Let's say this again, your thumb, your index finger, your middle finger, and half of your ring finger. So you can often have pain in your palm, pain throughout your hand, as well as decreased grip strength. Now, I want to tell you about one of the things that someone comes in the office with. Whenever I hear this, it's always one of the worst things I can hear. And that is if they come in and they say, well, Dr. Levi, I'm having pain in my hands and wrists at night that wake me up. That's never a good thing to hear because I found personally in my practice that approximately 80% of those people, no matter what I do with respect to treating them, within six months to 18 months, they end up needing surgical intervention. And I do want to remind you that when it comes to carpal tunnel syndrome, as well as any other health care issue in general, you want to do what you can to avoid surgery. Even though I'm a surgeon, I love medicine, I love operating, but guess what? It's the last thing that I do. So when it comes to treatment modalities for carpal tunnel, they're the following. You start off with changing what you do. Whatever your pattern is at work, the repetitive motion issues that you're doing, you want to do something different so that your hands and your wrists can take a rest. You want to wear a splint initially. Take an anti-inflammatory medication if that's discussed with your healthcare practitioner, like naproxen or ibuprofen. Those types of anti-inflammatories are actually quite effective usually for the initial stages of carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, if those things aren't working, the next step would be physical therapy. Because in physical therapy, they can teach something called gliding exercises. And I will show those later during the show and also talk about them. And I'll talk about how efficacious they can be for a lot of people. Now, if splinting doesn't work, anti-inflammatories doesn't work, physical therapy, then the next thing I recommend, of course, is to make sure that at work you get an ergonomic evaluation of your workspace to make sure that you have the proper keyboard, the proper chair and desk, and that you, as a person, you have to also be proactive about this. So make sure that you're very cognizant of your posture, that you're not doing things with your wrist bent over. You want to keep your wrist and hands in neutral position. Make sure you keep your shoulders up while you're at your desk typing. Make sure that you're not hunching over. The goal here is to watch your posture because your posture affects all of your life. It really, really does. It affects your spine. It affects your, you know, your neck, your cervical spine. But more importantly, it can also impact your nerves in your hand. Because don't forget your nerves, the median nerve, which is a part of the carpal tunnel complex, comes out of your neck. It's a part of the brachial plexus complex. So it comes basically from your, your neck down to through your to your shoulder, to your arm, your forearm, and then to your wrist and to your fingers. Now, 
if those modalities that I talked about, specifically, I want to review them one more time. You want to change what you do with respect to work, how you use your hands, how you use your wrists. You want to splint your wrist or your hands, especially at night. And why do you want to do it at night? Because often during your sleeping period, many of us, including myself, we go into a fetal position and we bend our wrists very extreme. So this bending motion will cause compression on the median nerve, therefore will increase or exacerbate your carpal tunnel syndrome, specific, specifically numbness and tingling in your hands as well as decreased grip strength. Now, I know I've talked a lot about this, but I do want to say this again. I want to reiterate this. Do what you can to avoid surgery. Do what you can to get healthy without surgery. So splinting, anti-inflammatory medication, stretching, the gliding exercises and therapy, as well as the ergonomic evaluation of your workspace, maybe decrease the amount of typing and texting that you're doing every day, decrease the amount of repetitive work that you do every day. Now, if those things are not effective for you, the next thing that I recommend is acupuncture. Now, in the medical community, there's often a lot of debate about the efficacy of acupuncture. Well, myself, I am very proactive about acupuncture. I'm about marrying Eastern and Western medicine. I believe that when you bring Eastern and Western medicine together, you get the best health care outcome. You know, it's not simply about doing everything your Western-trained doctor says work, works. What he or she says, that's great, but at the same time, you have to also explore for yourself. So get on the Internet. Search the Internet. The Internet has a lot of great information, but there's also a lot of stuff that's, that's not real, that's not authentic. So you have to be careful of the, of the source. Myself, as a Western-trained physician with a lot of Eastern practices in my practice, I think, again, I want to reiterate, if you bring Eastern and Western medicine together, I believe that you get the best results. So, and if acupuncture doesn't work, along with all the other modalities that you've tried, all of that has failed, then the next thing is to consider a steroid injection. Now, the steroid injection, what I use in my practice, is either Depomedrol or, or Kinelog, Triamcinolone. I found these two to be very, very effective. Now, with that said, you really have to talk to your health care provider about this because it is a steroid, even though it's a very tiny part of it. Any steroid, for example, that you take if you have diabetes can increase your blood sugar levels. Therefore, you may have to increase your insulin or metformin or glibozide or gliburide, whatever anti-diabetic medication that you're taking for maybe 24 or 48 hours. If your sugar levels pop up, you may have to take something to counter that. So that's something to also talk about and to be aware of. Now, with that said, if those treatment modalities are not effective, guess what? The last thing at the top of the hill, at the top of the platform when it comes to healthcare, would be surgery. But again, try your best to avoid surgery because even as a surgeon, I tell all my patients that surgery, think about it. Surgery, like taking a medication, does one of three things. This is the following. So no matter what any doctor tells you here on earth, or anywhere else actually, it does only one of three things for you. So surgery, like taking a medication, can do the following. Make you better make you worse, or no change. It's always one of those three. So you have a 33.33% chance of getting better, and you have a 66.66 chance of not getting better or actually getting worse. So and that's even in the most qualified hands. So myself, as your, as your humble servant, as your doctor, as, as Dr. Levi, the gamer's doctor, the, the doctor that wants to help you, I want to remind you that when it comes to surgery, it's a very specific insult that your body has to recover from. There's always a risk of infection. There's a risk of increasing pain. There's a risk of reflex sympathetic dystrophy, also called causalgy or chronic regional pain syndrome. There are a lot of things that can come forth from that. There's a possibility that your doctor may, may injure the nerve. You know, things like this can happen. I'm grateful to say it hasn't happened to me, thank God, but I do want to say this. Surgery is not a joke. Even taking off a toenail or a fingernail, every surgical intervention has a risk. And the risk, again, are the following, to make you better, to make you worse, or no change, all right? So I'm hoping and believing that this talk, your carpal tunnel boot camp, 
will be effective for you and help you to make really mindful, strategic choices about your health. You know, I'm excited about about doing the podcast. We have a podcast now. You can check out everything that every show that we do here will be uploaded to iTunes. So you can listen to the podcast for information. You know, I want you again to be empowered and to be educated and to be mindful about the strategic choices that you make that will impact your life. Why? Because you take you wherever you go. I want you to be healthy and I want you to know that every choice you make, there are consequences. Some good, some bad, and some, you know, midline. But we want you to make the best choices to have a great, great life. Now, we've talked about carpal tunnel. Let's also talk about tendinitis. Now, when it comes to the body, the body is like this amazing kinematic machine. I love the body. I love being fit. I love being healthy. I love reminding you to be fit and to be healthy. And I want to make one, I want to retract something about carpal tunnel. One thing I do want to add about carpal tunnel, like any issue of your body, do what you can to stay fit to eat properly, to minimize the amount of alcohol that you drink, to minimize the smoking that you do, but to exercise every day. Because we do know, of course, that exercise in general will impact your overall health. Why? Because exercise can decrease the inflammation globally in your body. And inflammation, of course, is a cause of chronic diseases like coronary artery disease, diabetes, high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, or hypercholesterolemia. All these things impact your body if you don't exercise. And of course, coronary artery disease is the number one killer of women and men in America. So it's so important that you do what you can to exercise daily. And again, if you can only work out 30 minutes a day, fantastic, bravo, do that. If you can only do 50 minutes a day, awesome, do that. If you can only do 10 minutes a day, fantastic, do that. The key here is to do something every day to honor your body with fitness and with exercise. You only get one body. So why not have a body that's healthy, that's fit? And then, of course, be mindful of what you eat. What you put in your mouth, what you digest, what you eat, it's very, very important. Because foods have phytonutrients, minerals, vitamins. You want to eat healthy. You want to make sure that you're choosing the right thing for your body. Later on in the show, I'll talk about some of my superfoods for 2016, foods that I want you to think about having more of in your diet this year. Now, we've talked about carpal tunnel. Let's talk about different forms of tendonitis. Now, when it comes to the body, there are so many forms of tendonitis. As an orthopedic upper extremity surgeon, I've seen them all, I'd say. Now, I want to tell you about one specific type of tendonitis. I may, I may talk about a second form also, but... Let's talk about some of the general forms. So when it comes to tendonitis, think about this. There's Achilles tendonitis. There's proximal anterior biceps tendonitis. There's the Quervain's tendonitis, which is tendonitis of the first extensor dorsal compartment of the wrist, which involves the extensor pollicis brevis tendon and the abductor pollicis longus tendon. There's also tennis elbow, also called lateral epicondylitis. There's golfer's elbow, called medial epicondylitis. There's rotator cuff tendonitis, which involves the four muscles of the rotator cuff of the shoulder. There's also iliopsoas tendonitis, which is a type of hip flexor tendonitis. I can go on and on and on. There's so many forms of tendonitis. However, I want to talk to you about one that I didn't mention called trigger finger or trigger thumb. It's also called flexor tenosynovitis of the finger. So the, the two that I'll talk about today are the following. Tennis elbow, i.e. lateral epicondylitis, as well as flexor tenosynovitis, which is trigger finger. Now, trigger finger happens when someone walks into the office and they'll say, hey, Dr. Levi, my finger stays down. It's more severe in the morning, and it often gets better slightly during the day. However, when I'm using my hand a lot, my finger will again start to lock and will be very, very painful. So that's called trigger finger or flexor tenosynovitis of the finger. Well, the question, of course, is, well, why did I get this? Well, like many <laughs> incredible questions in medicine, we don't know. We know that there's a, an association with diabetes, for example. Some people have diabetes. I found those patients to have a greater incidence of le locking trigger finger or flexor tenosynovitis of the finger. I've also found it to be more common in some of my patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. So 
there are correlations, but why some people get it and some don't, there are no clear-cut double-blind studies that have the definitive answer to that. If there were, I would share that with you because I want you to be empowered and educated. So now when someone presents with trigger finger, I'll give you an example. If you can see this on the screen, they'll have, let's go for the middle finger, for example, or the thumb. They'll have pain at the base of the finger, and the finger will lock. And they'll, if they come in, I'll ask them to open and close their hand very quickly like this. They'll do it with the other fingers, but that middle finger will stay down if the middle finger is the symptomatic finger. So how do we treat it, and then who develops this? I see it more often, again, in someone who has diabetes and repetitive motion injuries. For example, if someone does a lot of typing, a lot of keyboard, and a lot of data input, if they use vibrational tools like a jackhammer, for example, I see it in painters, I see it in mechanics, I see it in bikers and gamers, and even in UFC fighters. So it's, it's fairly common, yet why people get it, the common reason why is not. It's not a common reason why people get it. All right. Now, what do we do for it? So we treat it actually with, we can splint the finger sometimes, and that will help. I'm not big on splinting because I think splinting in general causes not only the immobility of the finger, but can also cause stiffness. So I'm not a big, I'm not big on splinting in general. Unless it's a fracture that needs to rest, I'm not big on splinting things. But many doctors still do this. Now, other ways we treat this is with an injection to the finger, to the A1 pulley or flexor tendon sheath, and we inject that with a little bit of steroid, like Kenalog or Depomedrol, um, and some people even use cortisone. So that often is quite effective. Now, when it comes to injections, some physicians say we can give an injection every six months or every three months. Well, I'm not a big believer in injecting the body with, with medications. I'm just not. I'll do it once, maybe twice, and that's it. Yes, I'm a surgeon. But I'm a very conservative surgeon with a lot of old school principles that I think are effective. And I think it's always best to do the following. One, modify your diet to eat foods that are not pro-inflammatory, like dairy, like minimize the amount of dairy in your diet, eating more fruits, nuts, vegetables, and grains to increase the, 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 the ability of your body to fight free radicals and to minimize inflammation. I think if we do these things, we have to consider this, I believe, and that is think of food, food as modern-day medicine. Not think about going to the pharmacist for, for medicine. I want, you to, I want to have that paradigmatic shift where we start thinking about food as our proper medicine. That's what it was before until it's been so bastardized now that we can't get the, the nutrients we need because the soil has been so denatured, because our air has been so denatured, because the water has been so denatured. So I want us to really think about what we can do to use food as modern day medicine. So eat properly and of course use exercise as modern day medicine. That's really, really important. Now, I don't wanna digress too much. Let's talk more about flexor tenosynovitis or locking trigger finger. So again, it's caused by the A1 pulley being often very thickened over the FDS, flexor digitorum superficialis, and FDP, flexor digitorum profundus tendons. And the tendons are are there's basically the A1 pulley makes this area quite stenotic and compressed. So if the injection doesn't work, and if also before the injection, we also try therapy, because sometimes therapy is helpful for this. I've even, oh, I want to share this with This is great. I've even tried acupuncture for this, and that's also been effective for some patients. So again, physical therapy, acupuncture, and injections. If the injections, I give at most two, no more than that. Usually I stop at one, but definitely no more than two. And if it comes back, if it's recalcitrant and comes back after two injections, then we talk about surgery. And the surgery takes about three and a half, five minutes, where we actually make a small incision. Let's say it's the middle finger again. We make a small incision at the base of the finger, right over the A1 pulley. We dissect down, and then we, we cut the A1 pulley so that the finger can move better. Now, of course, patients always ask, well, Dr. Levi, I, I don't need that pulley. Well, we need all the pulleys that we have. However, the A1 pulley is considered, quote, unquote, expendable because it doesn't take away from the kinematic ability 
of the finger to move properly. It doesn't cause any bowstringing of the tendon. So when we cut the A1 pulley, we can do that. Now, if you cut the A2 pulley, which is another pulley in the finger that helps to give kinematic advantage to the tendons when you move your finger and flex and extend your hands, then that can cause bowstringing and it cause, can decrease the amount of grip strength that you may have. But we're not talking about A2 pulley, we're talking about the A1 pulley, which is a part of, again, flexor tenosynovitis. Now, I hope that helps you with respect to the things we've talked about today, carpal tunnel syndrome, as well as flexor tenosynovitis. Now, if you want more information about this, of course, you can go to our YouTube channel, your YouTube channel, the Dr. Levi YouTube channel, and the most popular video on there is one for hand, wrist, and strengthening exercise. It has over, I believe, like 650,000 plus views, maybe more than that by now. And that's been very helpful for many, many, many of our viewership and subscribership to help prevent this problem as well as to help you recover from surgery. If you do have surgery, of course, you want to be aggressive about doing exercises to maintain the strength of your hands and your wrists and also to improve the strength of your hands and wrists. Now, let's talk about another very common form of tendonitis that I see, and that is tennis elbow, also called lateral epicondylitis. This is caused by the extensor carpi radialis brevis and the extensor carpi radialis longus tendons, which attach to the lateral aspect of your elbow. So, at the lateral epicondylar region, uh, region of your elbow. Now, what causes it? Well, we know that we see it more often in people who do a lot of repetitive motion. Now, often people say, well, I don't play tennis. Why did I develop tennis elbow? Well, it's a good question. You can develop tennis elbow and not play any racket sports at all or not even do any sports. You can develop it from repetitive motion. You can develop this from trauma, from lifting things improperly, from having a desk that's not ergonomically balanced. We don't know why, again, some people develop lateral epicondylitis, also called tennis elbow. We, we just don't know. But we do know that it's a, a form of, of inflammation of the tendons. And more importantly, actually, when we look at this surgically and, and look at the pathology after we study it, it's really simply micro tears of the tendon. And it's not simply inflammation the way we think of it. It's really these small micro tears that occur at the tendon, specifically at the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon, also called the ECRB tendon. Now, how do we treat it? Well, we first off with splinting. We put a compression, a compression elbow brace on. Again, a compression elbow brace. And you will wear that for an extended period of time throughout the day. And I never recommend sleeping with that brace, but you can wear it during the day. And we'll also give you therapy. And I'll show you one exercise that's been very effective classically for treating lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. It's called nursial. These are nursial exercises. I'm going to pull back my mic here so you can see this on screen. So it's done the following way. Extend your elbow. Your elbow is extended. You flex your wrist. And then you put your other hand in front of, your, of the flex wrist and you hold this motion. And you hold this motion for approximately 30 seconds. All right? These are called nursial exercises. I'm going to spell that. N-I-R-S-C-H-L. Nursial exercise. You hold this for 30 seconds. Then you extend your wrist and your hand and you extend, you you basically hold your hand and then extend your hand and wrist back further. The key here is to make sure you keep your elbow straight. If you bend your elbow, the stretch is not as effective. So keep your elbow straight. You feel right over the lateral aspects of your elbow. You feel that stretch occurring. And you hold that for approximately 30 seconds. I recommend doing three sets, 30 seconds each with the wrist flexed and with the wrist extended. I hope that helps. These are called nursial exercises. Now, I recommend that you do that if you're a, a radio show engineer, if you are a gamer, if you are a UFC fighter, if you are an assistant, if you are a typer, if you are a texter, if, you are, if you're still using a BlackBerry and getting BlackBerry thumb. You know, and getting tennis elbow, I recommend that you do this. So I hope this really helps you. Um, with that said now, if those things are not effective for you, 
Then the next thing we talk about will be an injection to your lateral epicondylar region. So we can inject tennis elbow, again, with a small amount of steroid. But before injecting, again, I want to reiterate, I recommend bracing, changing your activity levels, be mindful of your posture, eating foods that are less inflammatory, and, of course, therapy. And if therapy doesn't help, then the next thing, of course, is acupuncture. I want to go to just a brief aside about acupuncture. Acupuncture is really a modality of healing that is underappreciated, underused, yet overly criticized. And often people criticize acupuncture because the science of it is still not extraordinarily clear. We know it's very effective and it helps many people, but the modality, why it helps specifically, we don't know the, the complete story. The, the, the jury is still out about that. However, we do know that it's very helpful for many people. So I, I'm a big supporter of acupuncture. I think it's, it's helpful, especially for lateral epicondylitis, also called tennis elbow. Now, I'm going to just make one quick aside about something else at the elbow, another form of tennis elbow, excuse me, another form of elbow tendonitis called medial epicondylitis, which is golfer's elbow. And again, I, wanted, I want you to know, you can develop medial epicondylitis or, or golfer's elbow even if you don't play golf. Again, from repetitive motion, from using power tools like a, like a, like a jackhammer. I mean, you can be running a board, for example, if you're a, a radio show engineer. I mean, there's so many things that, that you can develop from overuse. Now, with that said, if the injection for lateral epicondylitis or medial epicondylitis is not effective, then we talk about the, uh, if the injection doesn't help, we talk about surgery. Again, the surgery is very, very, uh, it's a very, we'll call it minor surgery, but again, I want to reiterate, there's no surgery that's too minor because again, it, surgery can make you feel better, worse, or no change. So make sure you have that done, I recommend by hand orthopedic upper extremity surgeons. Even though general orthopedists and general surgeons, I believe, do the procedure, it's, it's better to have it done by a specialist because we do it all the time. It's like our, it's our it's part of our lives. This is what we do. This is what we live for to, to help people who have injuries to the upper extremity. Now, I want to talk just briefly about medial epicondylitis, golfer's elbow. Again, the same treatment protocol. Change in activity, rest, anti-inflammatory medication, bracing, physical therapy and acupuncture, then an injection. And if that none of that works, then I there are little form there there are forms of surgery that we do for that. I I don't I'm not a big proponent of them. So I recommend just doing everything you can to be as non-surgical about the golfer's elbow or medial epicondylitis as possible. Now so we talked about carpal tunnel. <laughs> we talked about uh, trigger finger or flexor tenosynovitis. We've talked about lateral epicondylitis, and we've talked about medial epicondylitis. So you've noticed all of them have an itis in there. Itis simply means inflammation. It means that things are out of balance. The inflammation is just very, very high at that specific body part physiologically. Now, with that said, I also want to talk about gamer's thumb. I take care of a lot of gamers in my practice. I find them to be a, a, a great, great population of individuals that are really dedicated to their sport. And I say sport because gamers are athletes. You know, often there's a lot of backlash when I say that, but they are athletes, period. They really are. They use their hands, they use their bodies in ways that are very intense because of the repetitive motion stress that their bodies undertake when they're gaming. And often they're gaming for 6, 8, 12 hours a day taking very few breaks. So I want to remind you, if you're a gamer and if you're listening, take breaks every hour for like three to five minutes if you can. If you cannot, at least every five minutes, every two hours. And if you go to the YouTube channel that we have, the Dr. Levi Harrison YouTube channel, there you can see exercises that are specifically garnered for gamers to help you with respect to stretching, to help you prevent injuries, and also to give you a protocol to use when you're gaming with respect to putting your hands in warm water. I have exercises there for your thumb, for your wrist, for your fingers. All of these things are geared to help you do one thing, have an extended career without any pain, without any drama. 
you know, as a surgeon, we don't like drama. We don't want you to have any, and we don't want to have any. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be fit. And we want you to use your body in a way that you can do whatever you want to do so you can have a really purposeful life. Now, let's talk about gamer's thumb. Gamers will often develop pain at the back of their thumb in two specific areas. So I'm going to put this on film so you can see this. So this is your thumb, of course. This is my thumb. <laughs> All right. So this is the interphalangeal joint, the IP joint. This is the proximal phalanx and the distal phalanx of the thumb. And this is the metacarpal of the thumb. This is the MCP joint. This is the IP joint. So with that said, often gamers will develop pain at the base of this area as well as down here. Well, why do they develop this? Well, it's very common from repetitive stress injury, RSI injury. Now, this is developed because of how they're using the console, their, their keyboard, or their mouse, or their trackball. I mean, it can be done from, because of so many, so many different types of modalities for gaming. So with that said, if you develop pain in these areas, the best things to do are the following. Number one, to rest. Take frequent breaks, do the stretching exercises that I'm going to show you in shortly, as well as if you can, try to switch up. Use your, if you're right, if you're right hand dominant, well, try gaming sometime with your left hand to give your right hand a break. Now, I know that sounds like, oh my gosh, how would I ever be able to do that? Well, it's not difficult. You can train yourself to be ambidextrous if you just do it. Like any muscle, if you flex it enough, you'll become stronger. Now, it may not be your power hand when, you come, when it comes to gaming, but at least it will give your dominant hand a rest. You want to be able to give your hand a rest so that when you are gaming with your dominant hand, it's ready to go. So let's talk about things that you can do. So besides rest and besides putting your hands in warm water throughout the day, putting ice on your hands maybe five to ten minutes before and or after, after a long gaming sequence. Other things you have to be mindful, your posture, how you're sitting. Are you sitting upright with your shoulders square, your back upright? Are your shoulders leaning forward? Are you hunched over the console? Are you hunched over your desk? All of these things are not helping your body in general. You want to stay as ergonomically balanced as you can. That even when you're driving, when you're in the movie theater, you want to be cognizant of your posture. And even when you're with your friends and your family at the dinner table and you're out, look around at the people and watch how often you'll see people whose shoulders are, are hunched over like this. Their neck is hunched over. They're not sitting upright. I want you to elongate your spine, you know, like a, like a dancer. You know, I think dancers have extraordinary postures. So you want to really sit upright. You want to really do what you can to maximize the health of your posture, as well as of your spine, as well as of your body. It's so very, very important. So, again, with gamers, let's go through a few things right quick. So rest, ice, warm water. Now, if you really want to invest in yourself, something that I have a lot of the UFC fighters do, a lot of executive assess assistants do, and that is you can buy paraffin wax and use the paraffin wax bath to put your hands in in the morning and at night. You will love this. You know, I've been doing this for an extended period of time myself, and it really, really works effectively. I'll tell you a really a quick story. For one person in my family, and I won't call her name, my mother, I won't say her name, though, uh, and I won't tell you who she is, but uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, I was telling her she was having some pain in her wrist and her hand. I said, well, Mom, why don't I get you some paraffin wax? And it will help you tremendously. And you put your hands in in the morning or during the day. And she said, okay, Levi, great. So I uh, got the wax for her finally, and I brought it home. And for about three months, she kept it in a box. So when I went to visit her, I still saw, I said, look, let me set it up for you. It's real simple. You put the wax, you heat it up, you put your hands in. You're going to feel better. Just, just trust me. So finally, when I was there, she did it. About four weeks later, I call her. I say, hey, Mom, how you doing? How, how's the wax? And then she says this. Oh, Levi, I have to really thank you. I really love it. I've been using it every day. She said, I have to ask you, son. You know, you're pretty smart. Could you invent something where I could put my whole body, I can take a body dip in wax? I thought to myself, unbelievable. It went from not using it for several months, now she wants to dip her whole body in wax. Let me not get started. I love you, Ma. 
Um, but I'm not going to tell me it was you, though. Um, <laughs> with that said, <laughs> with that said, the paraffin wax is a really great way if you're a gamer, if you have a lot of repetitive motion with your hands, it will truly help you to get um, a feeling of relief. And why does it work? Well, think about it. It works on a real basic scientific principle. Your joint fluid is very viscous, very thick. Think about it, like candle wax. Anything you heat up has decreased viscosity. It becomes more thin. Therefore, your joint fluid, if it's warmer, it becomes thinner. Therefore, you can move your hands better. I hope that makes sense. It's a very basic principle. If you heat something up, it becomes, it becomes lighter, becomes thinner. Um, now, with that said, the other thing I want to let gamers know is, you know, I have a lot of projects I'm working on right now to really help gamers in general. It can help anyone who plays a sport, basically, but there will be tools that I'm developing right now to help you to prevent injury as well as to recover from injuries and, more importantly, to extend your lifetime as a, a lifetime gamer or, a, or an athlete, really. I just want you to be healthy. That's the bottom line. So we talked about gamer's thumb. We talked about posture. We have talked about the fact that even as a gamer, you have to be fit. So I recommend that you work out 30 to 45 minutes a day. Be cognizant of your posture. Be cognizant of the type of keyboard that you have, the trackball that you're using, the game console that you're using, how much that you're using the console. Make sure that you use your, your non-dominant hand sometime to give your dominant hand a break. So these are basic things that I want to share with you. Now I want to show you some exercises. So if you can see your monitor right now, and I'll also explain them so that if you're looking at it or if you listen on our podcast, it'll also help you. So now extend your hand in front of you. Now these are for gamers with gamers. I'm going to turn to the side so you can see this. So drop your, flex your thumb up and down for a set of 15, Okay. So you're flexing at the MCP joint, which I showed to you earlier. Now you're going to roll your finger around the world. All right. Now you're going to reverse it back around the world. 15 times forward like this, and then 15 times the opposite direction. I'm making circles with my finger. Well, excuse me. I'm making circles with my thumb. So again, around 15 times and back around 15 times. Now you want to bring your thumb to the base of your small finger, the volar aspect or the palmar surface of your hand. So you take the pad of your thumb and you flex it over to your small finger. Again, do that 15 times. Okay? Up and down 15 times. Now you're going to lift your thumb straight up. You're going to take your, your index finger and your middle finger of the opposite hand. Now you're going to just flex your thumb but you're blocking at the IP joint, the inner phalangeal joint, okay? Just flex that for 15 times. Now, after 15 times like that, you're going to put your other thumb on top of the thumb that you are flexing, and now try to flex, but you're pushing down. So you have some resistance to the thumb, okay? So you're, you're trying to extend the thumb, but you're pushing down on it, so it, it's resistance, okay? I hope that makes sense to you. So... Again, your thumb is up, straight up, as if you're hitchhiking, basically. Or for some people, nose picking, maybe. So straight up, <laughs> you block it, and, <laughs> and you bend your thumb down. You flex at the IP joint, and then you, you put your other thumb on top of it. As you try to extend your thumb, you, f you push it down, okay? So that'll help. Then the next thing you want to do is you put your hand straight up, straight up in front of you with your palm facing the wall, for example. And now just bring your fingers together. Abduct and adduct your fingers. So you open your fingers and you bring them together. Open and close, open and close. Now, the next thing I want to show you this exercise, it's around the world. So you flex your wrist and you, you rotate it in one direction for a set of 15. Then you rotate in the opposite direction for a set of 15. Now, the, the ticket here is keep your elbow straight because you're going to want to, like, drop your shoulder or drop your elbow. Don't do that. Make sure your posture is erect, your hand is in front, around the world, back around the world. I wish you all were here right now. My entire team, we're all doing this right now in the studio. It's very, very interesting. We're all doing it so much, it's making wind in the studio. All right, so around and wrap around. Then the next thing you want to do is you, you 
have your palm in front you as if you're pushing against the wall. Now you want a tabletop. So you just flex at the MCP joints. You flex your fingers down at the MCP joint, just like this. Okay, now the next exercise, these are called windshield wipers. You flex your wrist and then just move your wrist side to side, just like that. Keep the elbow straight. Now you'll see this basic exercise will very much fatigue you. You get very tired quickly, but this will help you in the end, you'll get stronger. Like any muscle, if you flex, you get stronger. 15 times back and forth. The next one is called the English wave or the Queen's wave. You bring your hand up, again, as if your palm is to the wall, and go side to side, just like that. These basic exercises, even though they seem very simple, trust me, after you do them for five or 10 minutes, a set of 15, you will find yourself getting very, very fatigued. But in the end, if you do them every other day or for three to five minutes every day, they will help you tremendously. Okay. Now, with that said, um, I was going to talk briefly about, because um, I had questions about this. I want to talk briefly about acupuncture because I had a few questions. I want to really thank our international audience for all the questions that they submit. I want to talk briefly about acupuncture. The, the question I had a while ago was someone asking about acupuncture and pregnancy. So there's a lot of debate in the medical community about should someone who's pregnant get acupuncture. So some acupuncturists will actually do it, some will not. And there are some acupuncturists who have practices that are actually geared for helping people who have fertility issues, for really, you know, helping them to get pregnant. Now, with that said, Myself, I'm an orthopedist. You know, I'm not an obstetrician gynecologist. So, you know, I think for the questions of that magnitude, you really have to refer to them. The, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an orthopedic guy. I'm an upper extremity guy. So I do have my opinions about it that I will share with you, and I do think acupuncture is very effective for a lot of upper extremity issues and for tendonitis, as well as for post-operative pain relief. I think it helps a lot, meaning that after surgery, for my practice, I actually use acupuncture in my practice for people who've had surgery. It really helps them a lot. And they're, they're often very gracious and happy to do it because many times after, after surgery, people often think that, well, it has to be either just therapy or I'd have to take pain medication. Well, I'm not a big pain popper kind of doctor. That's not me. I think we have to do what we can, again, to use food as medicine, to exercise daily, to eat properly, to do exercises that can benefit us after we have surgery. And uh, just taking, you know, uh, pain medication that has a lot of uh, contraindicated issues, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of those. So, but that's my opinion. Now, you may go to another doctor, hear another physician talk, who may be the rah-rah king or queen about, about medicine. So, but that, that's, it's not Dr. Levi. That's not me. Um, okay. So I've talked quite a bit about tendonitis, about acupuncture, which I love. We've talked about carpal tunnel syndrome. This was your carpal tunnel boot camp. Um, I, I want you to know, again, I want to reiterate a few things. So number, number, number one, you can do the following. If you have questions about anything that we talk about on the show, you can refer, the, you can you can leave comments in the comment section on our YouTube channel. You can, you can send them via Facebook. You can send them via Instagram or, or my website. Whatever works for you, you have access to me. I am, I am not uh, somebody that does not want to interact with you. You know, the, the Dr. Levi community, uh, I want to interact with you. I want you to know that I'm available for your health care needs and issues. I want to help you to make decisions about your health care. I want to answer your questions. I want you to feel that as you're going through a journey or a healthcare challenge, that you're not by yourself. So if you have a question about some form of therapy that you're doing, well, ask me. I'll give you my opinion. If you're going through a cancer challenge right now, if I can help you, I will give you my opinion about things. But I just want you to know it's so important to have a very open, honest, frank, candid conversation with your doctor. He or she should be your partner. And if he or she, if they're not a vibrational match for you, if you don't feel like they're really listening, they're only giving you one minute of time, they're, only, they're coming in and out of the room, you're just a number, you don't feel like they even know your name, well, guess what? I don't blame the doctor. I don't blame him or her. I blame you for staying with them. So you have to say, okay, 
I may have a limited carriers in my in my health care plan. I may have Obamacare or Cover Care California or anything, whatever you have. There are always other doctors, trust me. If you do the research, there are other doctors, and we're out here. We're willing to help you. We want to treat you the way we treat our own families. You know, in my practice, our goal is one thing, to treat everyone who comes through the, the Harrison Orthopedic Institute, the Dr. Levi Harrison practice, to treat you the way I treat my family, my friends, myself. No difference. No difference. We're all the same because you're a reflection of who I am. Now, with that said, so carpal tunnel, lateral epicondylitis, flexor, flexor tenosynovitis, trigger finger, medial epicondylitis, acupuncture. Our next q and I'm going to talk about superfoods that I recommend for 2016. I have a lot of them that I recommend from kale to blueberries to salmon. When it comes to salmon, I'm not talking about farmed salmon. I'm talking about wild salmon. Okay, there's a big difference there with respect to their omega-3 uh, fatty acid uh, content. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about anything you want to hear. But again, once a month, Q&A. This is Dr. Levi with your show, The Dr. Levi Show. And again, you can leave your comments and your questions on all of our social media platforms. And again, our address is D-R-L-E-V-I Harrison. That's for everything website as well as for Facebook. And just I want to thank all of our subscribers for YouTube or 12,000 right now, just uh, a few million to go. I want to thank you for joining us. And again, I'm here for you to be of service. I want to really thank you. I'm very grateful to use this platform uh, to be a, a place of education and empowerment. All right. Well, take care. This is Dr. Levi. I will see you next week. Bye.